they could all be silent spreaders. No symptoms like coughing or fever, but they could well be passing on the coronavirus. Many doctors say only mass testing can break the chain of transmission. With the increase of cases in the neighborhood, I think it's good for me to know if I have the virus or not. There's a chance I'm asymptomatic. I don't know that, though. I live with my mother who's on dialysis, and of course, you don't know if you have the virus or if you're asymptomatic. But the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has changed its testing guidelines to exclude people who don't have symptoms, even if they've been recently exposed to the virus. That's got alarm bells ringing. Some experts say many patients appear most contagious right before the onset of symptoms. Models suggest half all transmissions can be traced back to people before they get sick, if they get sick at all. Well, let's talk about this with healthcare expert John Campbell, a retired nurse and academic who joins us from Carlisle, England. John, is this change in CDC guidelines dangerous? Well, the New York Times certainly seems to think so. The New York Times says this was done quietly, and it said it was done to exclude people who'd been in contact with symptomatic individuals. But if you actually go to the Centers for Disease Control website, it's slightly more nuanced than that. It's still advising people with mild symptoms to be tested. And of course, it's still advising testing for people that are in care facilities or work in, work in uh, hospitals, for example. What it's actually saying is people who've been in close contact and the defined close contact is six feet, which, of course, we would call two metres or less for more than 15 minutes. What it's actually saying is they do not necessarily need to be tested. Now, they can still be tested at the discretion of their nurses or their doctors or their clinicians or according to local guidelines. So it actually is a change. It's saying it's not necessarily that they need to be tested. So it's a bit, a bit of a nuanced change there. But I still think it's a problem because this means we could have people that are in contact with uh, known cases who could then be developing the disease. And we know that a large proportion of people are asymptomatic initially. Now, about half of those people that are asymptomatic initially will go on to become symptomatic eventually. But it's interesting, the latest data is showing that people are most infectious immediately before they become symptomatic and in the first day after they become symptomatic. And of course, the symptoms can start off as being fairly mild. So what this means is we could have a lot of people going around who are shedding large amounts of the virus that we don't know about if we don't test them just in case they've been exposed. John, you're talking well about. That, I think the, 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 if I can jump no, in there, you're talking about a large amount of people. I've I've read studies that show up to half yeah. those infected with COVID-19 show no or hardly any symptoms. Doesn't that make this fight almost impossible? Yeah, well, it makes it more difficult. You're absolutely right. The latest meta-analysis shows about 40, 47% of people might not develop symptoms. But about half of those will go on to develop symptoms over time. But many will have a mild disease. But it is, you're right, it's very difficult. It's very hard to fight an invisible enemy. And the only way we can make this enemy visible is by reporting symptoms or by testing. We need to test people. And as well as that, we now know, as well as testing, there's various other things we can test for in the blood to screen people as well, that it would be a good idea to do. Anything we can do to make this virus more visible is going to help. Then we can target our isolation, mm -hmm. we can target quarantines, and then we can be much more specific and targeted in the way we're attacking this virus. But John, Without tell me, how, how do we even invisible. know how many asymptomatic people there are out there uh, if they haven't seen a yeah. doctor, if we don't have that medical data, if there aren't even enough tests to do the mass testing you're talking about? It's remarkably difficult. You can, sometimes, you can tell to an extent by the amount of people that become symptomatic in the future and the amount of people that become hospitalised and even the amount of people die. But the main way that we do this is with antigen surveys. Now, different countries do this in different ways, but in the UK, the Office for National Statistics will test about a 1,000 random households throughout the country for the antigen. And because they're testing randomly in random areas, they can extrapolate that up to the whole population. So it is quite possible to give fairly accurate estimates or, or really mm -hmm. very accurate estimates of how many people in the community are infected at any one time. And thankfully, in the UK and Germany at the moment, that's relatively low. In Spain, it's much higher, and it's also climbing quite rapidly in France as well.
John, what about age? Does it play a role when it comes to being asymptomatic? Mm, it, it does. Um, it's about 27% of children are genuinely asymptomatic and only about 16% of adults remain asymptomatic. Now, many more, it has to be stressed, many more are asymptomatic for a period of time and then become symptomatic. But it remains the case that more children remain completely asymptomatic than adults, 27% of children and about 16% of adults. But just because they're asymptomatic doesn't mean things are going on in the body. If you do x-rays and CT scans, you can actually see changes that are going on. You can see changes in the blood. So even though people aren't feeling symptoms, there can still be physiological change. But the proportion of people that are completely asymptomatic is smaller than we did think at one time. John, great to get you on the show today. John Campbell, healthcare expert, coming to us pleasure, from Carlisle in England. Thank you. Well, some blame young people for the resurgence of the coronavirus in Germany. They say they're not sticking to social distancing rules. Here's Tessa Vita. We are in the centre of a possible corona hotspot, Berlin Central. This neighbourhood, popular for its bars and nightlife, is now seeing a rise in infections. We asked around, but most young people didn't seem to be worried. Some agreed to talk to us, but want to stay anonymous. Are you scared to get infected? Well, no, not at all. We don't think about it at all. We just want to go out. They said that a second wave would come, so why would it be triggered by people going out? We don't know how long time this corona is going to last, so... You can't just keep being scared, like, yeah, all the time, so... Infections in Germany are rising, and they're rising fast. Parties on the street are a problem, but bars and restaurants are also in the spotlight. We're going to check out this iconic bar here in Berlin, but before we go in, I'm going to put on my mask. Inside, we see that Germany's strict hygiene measures are being upheld. People keep their distance. And just like waiter Mario Kreiber, everyone wears a face mask when moving around inside the bar. Customers are allowed to take it off once seated at a table. But that seems to scare people off. Tonight, only a few guests are around. When coming in, there are guests who say, next door I didn't have to wear a mask. Why here? Then they turn around and leave. So my feeling is that as a bar, you are punished when you stick to the regulations. Another rule, customers are required to fill in these contact forms with their name and telephone number, but that's also a problem. I can't believe that Mr. Donald Duck with this weird address came to the spa, but look for yourself. The district of Berlin Mitte wants to fight the coronavirus by making more random inspections now. But their resources are limited, explains the mayor. We can only do so much. We have just under 50 employees. They work in shifts seven days a week, but we can't do more than just surprise checks. The inspectors can't check every bar, but their presence might remind people of just how serious the situation has become. In the end, things can only improve if guests show more responsibility. Over to Derek Williams now. Our science correspondent has been busy answering your questions on the coronavirus. Has there been any more research into people catching COVID-19 twice? This week, researchers have, for the first time, reported three scientifically documented cases of people um, being reinfected with SARS-CoV-2 after having it once. Um, lots of anecdotal cases have been reported before, uh, but this time the scientific evidence that reinfection really does occur is, is strong because the researchers say they sequenced the strains that were isolated in the first and in the second infections and showed that they were genetically distinct from one another. Now, it's important to note, by the way, that, that all of these claims are unpublished and, and, and still have to be confirmed by other scientists. But, but if they prove true, uh, what does it mean? Well, an interesting takeaway from me is that one of the patients had classic COVID symptoms uh, the first time around, but was asymptomatic when he tested positive the second time around, which, which could indicate that his immune response 
uh, was keeping it under control. Uh, so, so that's encouraging. Uh, but the fact that the tests were able to detect measurable levels of the virus in him the second time around also begs the question of whether people who get COVID-19 again um, could infect others, even if they're asymptomatic. Uh, that we don't know. Um, most experts say that this development, while worrying, is, is not unexpected based on what we know about our re immune response to coronaviruses uh, in general. Almost no one expects acquired immunity to SARS-CoV-2 uh, to be permanent. But, but until we have a lot more evidence of, of this happening to a lot more people, the questions of if and when people on average can be reinfected, and, and if they're infectious, if they catch it again, uh, those questions remain pretty open. And a warning from the CDC with winter coming in many parts of the world. Here's Director Robert Redfield. A bad flu season can really put certain hospitals into a uh, medical stress situation. COVID obviously has that potential to be so important with flu and COVID coming at the same time that we really try to take flu off the table as much as possible and embracing the flu vaccine is one of the most important things we can do.